their son were already getting ready to leave. So we didn't get to see them a lot, especially since we started at around 9, and then we were there until 11.30. And then when we came back, they were back for lunch, but then we usually had to go out because we had trips at night. <coughs> so we didn't get to see a lot of the family. But when we were there, she treated us like we were her family. I She's ended so up, sweet. yeah, she was so nice. I ended up losing my voice because we went out to a discoteca and the music was loud, so I had to scream so people could hear me. And she gave me rum and honey because <laughs> she thought that would make my throat better. And it didn't. But I took it just to make her feel better. <coughs> so, do you want to add? Yeah, I don't think we were there ever in the afternoon where there wasn't somebody coming in for extra help with math. And she was always, like there would just be this little study session of anywhere from one to seven kids there doing math homework. And as someone like me who's interested in getting into the field of education, I really thought that was a lot of dedication that even after the job, which she had to wake up super early to go to, and she was always doing, and even at night, it would be nine o'clock at night, and she was still tutoring people who came in. And that just, <coughs> just really inspired me to be like, I want to have that kind of dedication for whatever I want to do. And not only did she stay late, up late to tutor, but if we were out late, she would stay yeah. awake until we got back, even if we were out till 12.30. So she'd be up from like 5.30 in the morning until 12.30 12 at night waiting for us to get back because she wanted to make sure that we were okay, which I thought was really nice. Mom. Yeah. It was really nice to like have another like mom figure when you're kind of in a place where Bree is very good at Spanish. I am okay. I speak really good Spanglish. <laughs> and she was just really, just encouraged me to learn. I think my Spanish improved like tenfold. Yeah, at the beginning she needed me to translate for her, but by the end she was speaking completely for Maybe. herself. Yeah. And I, it was really impressive. Another interesting thing is in Granada, since there are a lot of white rich people moving into the city and they're taking up a lot of the bigger buildings, families have to cram into really small places. So multiple generations live in small houses at once. In our house, there were three generations and sometimes a four generations. The grandfather lived there and they took care of him. He couldn't walk at all, and so they had to feed him and carry him around. Um, Marta, her son, and her son's girlfriend, and then sometimes his son would come and we'd get to play. He played PlayStation all the time, so I got to watch him play Mario. It was really fun. Uh, apart from that, the big thing is they always had meals ready for us when we got back, <laughs> and there was a lot of rice and beans a lot of rice and beans. And I like rice and beans, but not with my breakfast. So that was, it, it took a little while to get used to. All right, so that's about what we experienced. All right, so then me and Ashley lived with a woman named Marta Espinosa. And it was kind of nice, because we were all like within like uh, us two and Brie and Michelle and um, Elizabeth and another girl. We lived like within five houses of each other, so it was really nice for meeting up. And they just, like they said, they were such, like Marta was such a mother figure. She always made sure, make sure you take taxis when you get home, make sure you have your keys. Like she was always making sure we had sunscreen and making sure we were really safe before we left all the time. And they always had meals ready for us. And they always, when we were there, they tried to spend time with us while we were in the household. And it was really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we also, um, our house also had three generations in the house. We had um, Marta and then her daughter, two of her daughters, and then one of their daughters. My home state was a little bit different because um, I lived with a woman that was a widow, and she it was actually just her that lived there. And then, but she had um, a cook and a cleaning lady that were always there, and sometimes they would sleep over. But it was mostly just um, Gloria that was there. Um, and Gloria loved animals because she had like a little zoo in the front of her house. Um, she had ducks, geese. She had like 
a bunch of turtles, she had three dogs, cats, tons of birds, a toucan, um, and this was all like actually like in her house. So it was really neat. Um, and she, um, she, yeah, <laughs> she took care of, well, I, you know, going to a new country, I got sick there, and she took care of me and, like, made me special drinks and stuff to help me feel better. And um, we actually, one night we were really tired, so we actually watched a DVD with Gloria, which was just nice to, it was like being with, like, your mom at home, so it was really cute. But, yeah. So um, I lived with a woman named Maria Luisa and her husband, and then also her son and his wife lived there too, and then their son and daughter. So it was also multiple generations in the house. And at first I lived with um, another one of the students, Erin, but as Bree had said, she had left five days early, so I was there um, by myself. And it was just an interesting experience because while I was down there, um, a very close family friend had passed away, so I was dealing with that while I was down there. And um, I would sit when we would come back from activities or volunteering in the community. I would come back and just sit at the dinner table. And sometimes Maria Luisa, she worked at um, a women's empowering program, and she was like one of the founders. So she would be really busy, but I would sit with her daughter-in-law at the dinner table, and she was just one of the most welcoming and sweet, sweetest women I had ever met. She was giving me advice about different things. We talked about um, the Sandinista revolt and how they were, um, how their government was. And um, so I had a really close relationship with her, especially because there wasn't another student for the majority of my stay. So, um, and I also bonded a lot with the, with the kids. There was an eight-year-old little boy named Austin, and then Nadieska, who was two, his little sister. And we would play, and they would tell me interesting things about their schools. And um, they, they loved to play. I brought my phone, but I didn't have reception, but he would play um, Angry Birds on my phone. And it was just the most amazing thing to him. And he just loved it because they don't have those types of things really down there. Um, and also another relationship, or another woman that I um, gained a really close relationship with was at the um, Internet Cafe, since they don't have um, like phones or really internet, at least in my house they didn't. I would go there especially to like communicate with my family because there was such um, like hardship and like all these sad things happening back at home. So I would go there a lot and there was a woman, um, Doña Rafaela, and I would come out of the booth crying and just I felt so um, alone and dealing with such a difficult time, you know. And she would just comfort me. She knew five different languages and um, English wasn't one of her strong ones, and Spanish wasn't one of my strong languages either. I'm okay, but not fluent, and it was just an interesting, because we couldn't communicate perfectly, but um, just her being there to support me, it was one of the most life-changing experiences I had ever dealt with, so that was my personal experience with my home school. All right. So uh, yeah, I stayed in a house with the other two guys that were on the trip. They're not here today, but uh, yeah, we stayed. And a woman that took care of us was named Javiera, and she was living with her parents and her brother. And, uh, and there was also a servant there most of the time. And then they had two people basically doing farm work in the backyard. They had a, a ton of birds to take care of, geese and chickens. And I think almost 10 parrots, so sleeping at night was difficult, but, uh, but it, it, was, it, was, it was really neat. Um, yeah, I think um, our relationship with our homestay was a little bit different. Uh, Javier kind of just treated, treated the homestays as her job, which was, which was fine, so she wasn't like a motherly figure to us or anything, um, but yeah, they were, they were they were nice people. We got to learn a lot about them. And they had a few businesses throughout Granada. When one was a, a party store that was actually part of their house, so it's named Fiestas y Mas. And uh, at different points of the day, kids would come up to the door and ring the doorbell and get a get a, some pinata or, or something, fireworks. So that was really fun. It was a good experience. 
Another thing to note about all, well, most of the houses, they're open to the air because it's so hot outside and they don't have air conditioning. They can't afford it. So everything is open. There's an open patio in the middle of their house so birds will fly into their house and there are lizards all over. So that was, that was really fun. And then the second thing is they have running water, but running water is super, super expensive. So, uh, and also, they were doing construction work on our road, so we didn't have running water most of the time. So if we had to go to the bathroom, we had to fill up the toilet tank with the bucket water, or we had to take a shower at the bucket water, and it was cold, which felt nice since it was 95 plus degrees outside. So that, I know pretty much everybody on our street had to deal with that aspect of the homestay. <coughs> So we just did a few more things that night. Like I said, we had trips. We went to Pueblos Blancos, which they make a lot of ceramics. That's pretty much how they make their living. Each generation learns from the prior generation the art, on, the art of making ceramics. And then they do that, and they sell out of their house. So we went there, and we bought some pottery. And we actually got to learn how to make it. And there was a guy throwing, doing things in the pottery wheel, and we we got to make pottery. We weren't very good at it, but he helped us, and that was an interesting moment of our trip. We also went to Wokan Mombacho, which was really close to town, and we did zip line to the jungle, which was really, really fun, and the guys were really nice. We had a really big group, too, so <laughs> the guys were very interesting. If <laughs> had to use a word. Uh, oh, we went to a concert, and we actually have a picture and a video so you guys can hear a song. He was a famous singer during the Sandinista Revolutionary Movement. And he just he's, talks about the pride of Nicaragua and how everybody should work together and if they all work together, they'll succeed. And it was just, it was very touching since I speak Spanish and I understood what he was saying. It, I would come really close to tears at some point, some points during the concert because it was just such beautiful music. And also, yeah. And also there was, it was in a school called Botejitas, which was like a, a school, it's okay, a school for, it was just for a whole bunch of things. They had, acrobats, performance yeah. arts, and they were really good. It was really cool. And this is a video of him singing. Why is it working? It is. Should it be in the headphones section, I think? Solidaridad, which did start as a shanty town, so that before they were all living in shacks, but the government, if they raised enough money to get supplies, the government would build homes for them. And they would have five people living in a tiny space, like a quarter the size of this room. And they were so proud of it. And they would apologize to us. They'd say things like, I know this isn't much. I know it's really small, and we don't have any things like a TV or a computer, but I'm really proud of what we have. There was a man, it was the woman's son, 
he had throat cancer and he couldn't eat, but they couldn't afford treatment to put a tube into his stomach. So he literally was just laying in a hammock in, on the porch in the front yard and they were just waiting for him to die. And I thought that was extremely depressing because you wouldn't see that here. So that was shocking for me. Anybody else? <laughs> I, I can talk. Um, kind of going off of that, the pride was really interesting to see. I know you mentioned the woman, but a lot of people would say like, oh, I know, we don't have this, we don't have this, but I'm, I'm very proud of what we have. And also just the strength of the family unit was really, really interesting to me. Um, when we were doing arts and crafts, we made these Mother's Day boxes, and the kids got so into it. They were so into decorating it, and they were telling us all the things they would put in them and give to their mothers, and we asked them, like, you know, like, what, what do you do with your mom and stuff like that, and they would always get this giant smile on their face, and I, I know we feel that way here about the United States, too, but it was just really, like, really sweet to see. I think it was probably a little bit more, more passionate than what we would display here. Anyone else? <laughs> Um, if you guys were like knew in advance what area you were going to be focused on when you went there, so yeah. some of you, okay, so they sort of matched you up based on what you study or your interest area. We did. We gave them our level of Spanish and like our major and all the people that were like pre-med type of things got to work in the clinic, and then based on um, like Spanish, then like the English people. So since Brie was the most fluent in, in Spanish, she got to help with the English. And then for our home stays, they tried to put people that were more confident with Spanish with people that were less confident with Spanish. So you had at least one person in your household that could communicate really well with the family. Um, and then I was wondering, as far as um, the, the medical situation goes, we've talked about it a few times. So you, one of you mentioned that like the rural clinic, that they would still get medication even if they couldn't pay for it, but is that just for like really basic medicine? I mean, if it was something more serious with this other man, this the government doesn't have like socialized medicine? Um, but yeah, they basically just had like the basic type medicine, like um, just like the basic antibiotics and stuff. Mm -hmm. but, and then I think they would get like a little, a bit from the government. But then, sorry, what was the other part of your question? Well, just because, um, Maria just mentioned this about this this man who had, was just sort of waiting to die because he couldn't get access, they couldn't afford cancer treatment. So I just wondered if if it was like you could get you could get treatment for free if it was just basic medicine, but you want you need more serious coverage, then you need to have the money to pay for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the program fees were like three hundred dollars, and then our airfare was around like five hundred dollars. Are any of you in contact with any of the kids or the families, or do you plan to stay in contact? Um, I'm still in contact with the program coordinator down there, um, and we're hopefully gonna like, continue to send students down there. And then, unfortunately. Um, I mean, Ashley's host mom said, yeah, you should find me on Facebook, only there's like thousands of Marta S. Pinonzas <laughs> on there. So she wasn't in like the first like few pages, so I'm not, but I'm sure that if I contacted um, the lady that I'm in contact with down there, I could get in contact with her stuff. So. I feel like we should mention Carrie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Man, Carrie, she was so dedicated. Awesome. She was the head of UN Nicaragua and she was just she had a son, so it's not like she didn't have responsibilities of her own and she was a single mother. But she was so dedicated to that problem program. It had been her life for five years, right? Yeah. She was from here and she had just went down there and she just started it, the program. So So she was the head, the boss. And especially being a woman down there since it's a mech uh, society that's so based on machismo to try and defeat something like that and then help minorities and people who are in poverty and people who don't get recognized like she made a point 
the women I was teaching, the young girls that I was teaching, often they spoke really quietly or they didn't speak at all because they felt really ashamed because you don't do that in that society. Women usually stay quiet and the man is the one who speaks. She made a point for me to teach them and it's okay to be outgoing and to speak your mind because she didn't want that to keep repeating and a community where we had such a great influence. I still keep in contact with my family and um, they, I email back and forth with both the daughter and the, the mother that were there and I actually sent a care package for the son and the, like the granddaughter and the grandson of um, a stuffed animal from Angry Birds that they sell. <laughs> And a Barbie doll for the little girl, and um, she said that anytime I'm back down there, I can always stay with her. Like, they're s extremely welcoming. And then we actually, in our family, or um, what was his name? The other guy who was staying with us. Oh, oh, I don't remember. He was a former name. intern who helped um, like three families start a pinata business, and. He kept in contact with them so much that um, they actually asked him to speak at the daughter's quinceanera. And he was, I keep blanking on his name, but he, um, he was from North Carolina and he was just, one day we like, come for breakfast and we're like, oh, hello other college age white man, how's it going? <laughs> and it was just really interesting to see like, oh, he had such a great relationship that they wanted him to come back and stay with them. Um, now and actually because the trip was so successful we're um, hopefully going to apply um, for a grant this year to keep up a program um, in Nicaragua so we're looking into it. Excellent. Well I know there are some informational sessions about writing your proposal in November and then the proposals are due I think early February. That, that's really good to know. Yeah yeah and then the other thing is next Thursday September 22nd the Margaret Center is having their 15th anniversary celebration noon until 5, and during uh, the afternoon there's going to be um, uh, an opportunity for students that are working on this new uh, initiative called the Wisconsin Without Borders. It's interdisciplinary service learning within a, within a global context, and there's a, lo uh, a huge momentum on campus for students and faculty to be doing more of this kind of work, and they'll be growing support for doing that, so if you're interested, anybody's welcome. I think that the current government in Nicaragua is sort of controversial. Uh, did people talk about that? I mean, are they content? Or, I mean, Daniel Ortega was a former FMLN. They didn't really talk about it. We did have a presentation from a history teacher. Where did he live? Matagalpa? Yeah. And he came, and he's actually really well renowned. And he talked about he actually grew up during the Sandinista movement. and. He was in school, and a teacher held up a newspaper with pictures of dead people who the government had killed on it, and he said, this is what happens to you rebel dogs, and you deserve to die. And another student picked up a desk and threw it at him and said, my uncle was one of those people. So he was very open about how he felt before, but they didn't really, the families I think avoided it because I don't think they thought we knew about it. So it was an avoided topic. My family, we actually did discuss um, like what I had learned at that, um, that little lecture that we had. And they were there was like an election that was going on like around the time that we were down there. And they were just really hopeful that um, like, like progress was going to be made. 
and they were talking about, um, he gave an interesting aspect of how they view Americans, but my family was like very accepting of me, and they said, like they said that they don't view all Americans in that light, but because of the, um, how they kind of helped keep them. Um, they supported the government. Yeah, that. And the government, they slaughtered a whole bunch of people. So they didn't like the fact that our government supported the slaughter, so they didn't really like us. And But while we were there, I didn't encounter a lot of issues with that. This is sort of separate, but are you planning on reading uh, Enrique's Journey, or has some of you already started reading that book? I've actually started reading you it, started the reading Big Red Go Read, yeah. And it's actually very, um, something. it's free, the book. So. Um, uh, I'm teaching a course through uh, the Center for the First Year Experience, and we're actually having the discussion about that book with another book as well. So it's like a requirement, but it's very, very interesting. Kind of gets into the political. Yeah, because that would be for you that were there. I mean, it's not Honduras, but yeah. Any other questions? Um, well, in our group, we were planning on trying to get an international trip going, and so we had committee members that were interested in helping planning, um, do some research online and find organizations to work with, and someone found this organization to work with, and like we wanted it to be low cost, and um, when I got in contact with Carrie, she was just so amazing, and like, planned everything out and so we were really confident that like it wouldn't fall through if we wanted to.